This is Profit Central. Welcome. I am glad you are here with me as I go through the word of the Lord given to Isaiah. This week we are in chapters 55 and 56, and we will be likening these words to ourselves and our current situation that we may profit spiritually and learn from these things, repent more deeply, and come closer to our God. So our word summary this week, we are going to read 760 words in chapters 55 and 56. The overall tone is absolutely positive, even more so than it was last week that was 80%. This week we get 83% positivity. I marked 17% negative. The very end, we get this interesting twist that kind of takes us in a new direction for the following week when we get into chapter 57. So stick around. Let's get into the text. Beginning in chapter 55, we'll read verses 1 through 5. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. We get a good start to these two chapters with a message of us needing to realize the lack of the true covenant blessings in our life. And also we need to repent of our transactional salvation that we think we need to boost our status with God with works or basically purchasing that salvation. And oftentimes it does include actual money or treasures of the world. Think of the buildings. Think of the requirements to enter into those buildings. It involves actual cash money and other things of the world, other resources. We have worked and even spent money to achieve and to retain salvation in our minds when you really dig down to the root of it you find these truths but as we have been told it is all in vain and can never bring true salvation it goes without saying only god can bring salvation and he calls us to repent and receive his fullness of blessings it's mentioned here in fatness and god's covenant has been made known to our predecessors, it has been recorded in scripture to remind us and to also guide us to God's kingdom. And that kingdom will be desirable to all of the world once it is built in truth. The next set of verses we will read six through nine. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We get a very common and popular passage or verses here that many will recognize. But keeping this short, I'll say that the Lord will reveal himself and be found by his chosen people, that those that repent and seek after him. And we need to leave our old life behind, put our natural man to death, and let God and his work change us, that we may ultimately receive a remission of sins, have our sins taken away, that they not continue, that they not expand, and that we not go through life without having experienced the power of God and partaken of the divine nature. And to touch on verses eight and nine, our earthly way of worship and our understanding that we think is the fullness, we think is sufficient, 
it will never amount to salvation. And only if we worship in truth, as in John chapter 4, Jesus tells the woman at the well, if we worship in truth and in spirit according to God's will, that is what amounts to salvation. Now verses 10 through 13. For as the rain cometh down in the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy, and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. My commentary is that God's word will be a great nourishment. Think about our being told to feast on the words of Christ in 2 Nephi chapter 32. So this nourishment will be to the world and will not go unfulfilled, God says. God's covenant will make us joyful and peaceful and will cause all of creation to praise the Lord. And you can liken us to the trees. It's interesting that he chose deciduous trees or evergreens as a symbol of his everlasting covenant. So as all the earth is praising God for his goodness, all creation. The effects of the fall of Adam and Eve are going to be reversed here. We see that God's chosen people will be restored to his presence and the earth will not bring forth the thorns and briars, but it is going to be abundant just as the garden was. Now we're on chapter 56, starting with verses 1 through 5. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment, and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house, and within my walls a place and a name, better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. This is a glorious passage here as we start chapter 56. God is saying that he will soon reveal the fullness of the gospel and pour out his spirit upon his chosen heirs of salvation. And as a commemoration of looking forward to the fullness of God's rest and glory, we must keep the Sabbath, the Lord's appointed Sabbath in purity, just as he appointed from the beginning. Going back, looking at Genesis, we have evidence to find how that Sabbath was truly appointed, not through a simple unbroken chain of seven day weeks, but God's creation has signaled those appointed times. And today happens to be the Sabbath. I release these videos on the Sabbath as God has appointed, but we need to deny ourselves of vanity and idolatry as we have been accused of throughout many of these chapters in Isaiah. I've said it before, I'll say it again, God's call to repent and obey is to all the people of the world, especially those who profess his name and those who are super religious and, and believe and worship and do all the things that they think they need to do for salvation. And the time is coming when God will not withhold his spirit from anyone who hearkens to his voice in true humility and repentance with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And what's more important than an earthly or eternal family? The eunuchs here are blessed with things greater than children because they can't have children. Yet that was the treasure of the world, to pass on your name and your legacy, your birthright. Well, the most important is having the name of Christ upon us 
to become his children, part of his eternal family, because his family is the only one that is eternal, not ours, not by our own power, not by the enchantments that we make with supposed priesthood sealing power, going back to chapter 47. We want to be part of Christ's family. We want him to be our eternal father and we want his bride, Zion, to be our eternal mother. We are adopted and gathered to them. We have read last week with an examination of God's eternal marriage. We've seen a lot of messages about this family of God and the nature of an eternal family. Now we'll read verses six through nine. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him, beside those that are gathered unto him. All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. We get more talk of God's kingdom, his house, his family that will be residing there. God will bring many people who repent to his house and his kingdom will, and will no longer reject the sacrifices. Going back to Isaiah 1, where he did reject, he said he was done. He was full, could not take any more. He will gather in his chosen to be adopted sons and daughters of Christ. As I said, this really builds off of previous chapters, going back to chapter 49 and even 47 and, and before that. But Christ and Zion will be the mother and father of this kingdom. And as these chosen children are gathered into them, they are to feast upon the word and his abundant blessings that are poured out upon them. All right, we are at the end for this week. We'll read verses 10 through 12. This is the interesting twist that leads us into chapter 57 of next week. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain, from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. So who are these people? They are those of Jacob and Israel, those of God's people, or specifically the leaders, the watchmen, who are supposed to be ascending up onto the tower, looking out over for warnings and telling the people when danger is is coming so that they may be prepared so that they may fortify themselves against the powers of the enemy that seeks to invade and overtake them now god pronounces these leaders to be blind and sleeping and lazy they are not having a voice to raise a cry of warning to the people or to the believers who look to them for help. That's what their simple duty is, is to have a warning voice because they are supposedly above everyone else in spirituality and in understanding visibility of the spiritual woes and dangers ahead. And all they give are smooth messages and this takes us back to many previous chapters and also into other prophecies in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others beyond. So God is telling us that these leaders continue to extract tithing from the members and they have this great excess of investments of the world, these treasures of the world. This is likened to the leaders of the Jewish church in Christ's time. He says they were full of excess. They devoured the widow's house. Now these priesthood leaders are considered to be idolatrous and self-centered. They are greedy, God says, and they claim the power of God. Again, going back to chapter 28, 
on this drunkenness, this wine of the priesthood, and they claim that their religious kingdom is holy and is well and is prospering. They say all is well in Zion. They sing it. And they say, yea, Zion prospereth. Tomorrow will be just as good as today, but even more abundant, more wealthy, more temples, more buildings, more priesthood control, more policies and procedures. What does Nephi say in in 2 Nephi chapter 28 about our current state? Who has pride and who is building up churches? Well, this is the interesting twist that is kind of tagged on to this very, very positive message. So stick around to next week. We'll get into chapter 57 as it continues on this twist. As usual, I pray that you all may take the Spirit as your guide and continue in your repentance, continue drawing nigh closer to Christ, that he may become our eternal Father. So until next time, God bless.